So, what transporter proteins are present in enterocyte cell membranes? Enterocyte cells in the small intestine possess a number of different transporter proteins. Some of these are found on the side of the cell which faces into the intestine, which is called the apical surface of the cell, while others are found on the side of the cell which faces away from the small intestine. And this is known as the basolateral membrane, where molecules are released into the bloodstream. Here you can see some of the transporter proteins present in the enterocyte cell membranes. You will notice that there are different transporters on the apical and basolateral surfaces. Not all the transporters are shown, as there are a large number of different transporters, and each cell has a different selection depending on its function. In order to understand what happens when someone is ill, we first need to understand how absorption takes place in a healthy gut. First, let's focus on what happens to the glucose. Glucose is transported into the enterocyte cell across the apical membrane by a symporter, which also transports sodium ions. So when sodium ions are transported into the cell, glucose is transported in at the same time. The glucose then leaves the cell via the basolateral membrane by facilitated diffusion using a glucose transporter protein and it will enter the bloodstream. Clearly, it's important that we can absorb the maximum amount of glucose from our diet. If we think of how the human body has evolved, we've not always had plenty of food available. And even now, many humans don't get enough food to maintain good health. So we mustn't waste any of the food that we're actually able to eat. Simply absorbing the glucose down a concentration gradient won't ensure that all the glucose is absorbed. So, how does the enterocyte cell ensure maximum absorption? The key to this is the active transporter on the basolateral membrane. This pumps sodium ions out of the cell and exchanges them for potassium ions. This is an example of active transport. It uses energy from the breakdown of ATP to drive this process. So this transporter is known as a sodium-potassium ATPase. This ensures that the sodium concentration inside the enterocyte cell is always low. So sodium is drawn into the cell across the apical membrane down a concentration gradient, and it brings the glucose in with it, as glucose is transported with the sodium ions. So as long as there is glucose and sodium ions present in the gut to transport, these will be drawn into the enterocyte cell. The transport of glucose is described as secondary active transport. The glucose transporter does not require ATP itself, but nevertheless, absorption of glucose depends on energy being used to create the sodium ion gradient. The potassium ions that are brought in by the sodium-potassium ATPase can leave the cell via facilitated diffusion through a transporter protein on the basolateral membrane. This makes sure that potassium ions don't build up inside the cell. So now we have to think about what happens to the water. Well, as the sodium and glucose are drawn into the cell, this makes the water potential inside the cell more negative. And so water is also dra drawn across the apical membrane from the gut by osmosis, down the water potential gradient that has been created. We're talking about serious amounts of water being absorbed in the small intestine. The human small intestine absorbs about eight liters per day. As the water enters the cell, this makes the water potential inside the cell less negative. And so it sets up a water potential gradient across the basolateral membrane. So the water then flows out of the cell and towards the circulation. In fact, for those of you who are interested in studying this topic beyond A-level, 
there's evidence that we really can't account for all the absorption of water by considering the water potential gradient across the membrane on its own. It's been suggested that water is actually transported across the apical enterocyte membrane by the transporter protein along with the sodium and the glucose. So now we can begin to understand how oral rehydration salts work. Imagine the enterocyte cells lining the gut of someone who has diarrhea and vomiting. There's nothing in the gut to absorb. So no glucose and sodium to enter the cell and create that vital water potential gradient to drive water movement into the cell. If a patient who is badly dehydrated is given water on its own, some will be absorbed, but absorption will be very inefficient. However, if you give the same patient rehydration salts, the glucose and the sodium from the mixture will be absorbed by the cell. This recreates the normal water potential gradient across the apical membrane, so the absorption of water will be much more efficient. And the patient will be rehydrated once again, and much more effectively. Of course, although treating diseases such as cholera is a vital use for rehydration salts, these patients are not the only people who are at risk from dehydration. Another group who need to be aware of this risk are athletes, particularly endurance athletes such as marathon runners. If weather conditions are very hot, runners can easily find themselves in serious difficulty. Fluid is lost from the body as sweat. And as sweat also contains sodium chloride, excessive sweating can lead to dehydration and iron imbalance in similar ways to the effect of vomiting and diarrhea. Runners tend to think of water loss in terms of percentage decrease in body weight. If large amounts of fluid and salt are lost, say around 5% of body weight, runners can become exhausted. And if loss continues, they may even collapse and potentially die. Even at a much lower level of loss, as little as 2% of body weight, athletic performance decreases. So not surprisingly then, many athletes use isotonic sports drinks when exercise. And guess what they contain? Yes, you're right, glucose and sodium chloride. Exactly the same principle is used here to prevent or treat dehydration. Understanding our bodies and how the processes within them work is very important in keeping healthy and preventing avoidable death from illness. We've looked at some examples of this today. By understanding how our gut absorbs nutrients, we have designed a simple remedy, useful to athletes and anyone with sickness and diarrhea but potentially life-saving in serious illnesses such as cholera.